Good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to the RCVS Fellowship Evening. My name is John Innes and I'm the Chair of the RCV RCVS Fellowship Board, the body responsible for leading the Fellowship. I'm delighted that so many of you can join us online this evening. Despite being far more accustomed to virtual events than I was at the last Fellowship Evening, I'm sorry again not to have the opportunity to greet all of our new Fellows in person. Nevertheless, I'm honoured to be welcoming 38 new Fellows to the Fellowship this evening and I'm very much looking forward to meeting you all in person very soon. Our ability to adapt and to change has come far in the last year and a half, from running our training sessions virtually via webinars to modifying our practices to keep our staff and clients safe. I think we can all be very proud of what we've achieved under the circumstances. We have one or two tricks up our sleeve for this year's virtual fellowship event which have not only made celebrations last a little bit longer, but also we hope will make each part as accessible as possible for everyone. I think that's a win-win if you ask me. Prior to this evening, there's already been a week's worth of online events, including several excellent presentations from our Fellows of the Future. Our Fellows of the Future research competition gives those at the very start of their veterinary careers the chance to talk about a piece of research of which they are proud and want to share with the profession. More on this a little later. We've also been treated during the week to three Fellows in Focus talks given by eminent members of the profession. The talks are from Professor Mandy Peffers, FRCVS, who is research lead in musculoskeletal and ageing science at the University of Liverpool. Dr Joan Smith, FRCVS, Professor of Pathobiology and Veterinary Science at the University of Connecticut and Christopher Shales, FRCVS, Head of Soft Tissue Surgery at Willows Veterinary Centre and Referral Service in Solihull. Thank you very much to our three fellows in focus for taking the time to put their presentations together. We broadcast all of these talks earlier this week on our website and we'll hear a little bit more about them later this evening. Now, on to this evening. Over the next hour or so, we'll be celebrating the achievements of some inspirational people from across the veterinary professions, not least our new fellows. We have an exciting program lined up for you, including the formal admission of our new fellows and the opportunity to hear a little bit more about the fascinating variety of fields in which they work, the announcement of the winner and the highly commended entries of the Fellows of the Future competition. And to round off proceedings, we'll be welcoming Professor Tim Spector, Professor of Genetic Epidemiology at King's College London, to deliver his keynote speech entitled The Future of Personalised Nutrition. Tim is the epidemiologist behind the groundbreaking COVID Symptom Study app, an innovation which directly influenced how the UK responded to the pandemic. And he's also director of Twins UK, the biggest adult twin registry in the world, set up to investigate the genetic and environmental basis of a range of complex diseases and conditions. I'm very excited to be hearing from Tim a little later. Before we begin our admission ceremony though, I should first like to update you on some key developments that have been happening within the fellowship over the last year. Cast your minds back to last year, where we were thrilled to welcome Dr. Cheryl Scudamore to the position of Vice Chair of the Fellowship. One of our key ambitions was to improve diversity across the Fellowship, something that the rest of the board wholeheartedly supported. Over the past 12 months, we've organised unconscious bias training, recruitment training for the panellists, responsible for assessing applications to the Fellowship, and have also addressed diversity amongst those panellists. A couple of our concerns that we wanted to address were the gender imbalance on the panels, and the lack of female representation across the fellowship. I'm pleased to announce that this year, more women than in any other, any other year have been awarded a fellowship, with women making up over half of this year's new fellows. I'm looking forward to continue our mission to make the fellowship more diverse, and want to extend my thanks to everyone who has put this much needed training into place. On the subject of the fellowship directory, I would encourage as many of you as possible to use it as a resource to reach out both to each other, but also to the wider profession and the public. If you have a research query, a problem you want some advice on, or a curiosity that you want someone to shed some light on, I'm sure there will be someone in the fellowship directory who will be able to help. It also works the other way. For example, when the RCVS receives requests from the public or media about our fellows' research and expertise. It is a wonderful tool for collaboration and I thank you for indulging me in a touch of shameless plugging for the directory. And so to our formal admissions of new fellows to the register. 
While this year we will again have to forego the usual photo opportunities, I'm delighted that we are nevertheless joined now by RCVS President Dr Kate Richards. Good evening and welcome Kate. Thank you John and good evening everyone. It's a real honour to be with you all tonight. Thank you for inviting me to be here this evening. One advantage of our virtual format this evening is the opportunity to hear a little bit more about each of our new fellows to help illustrate the fantastic breadth and depth of knowledge and experience that is becoming part of this learned society. So without further ado, Kate, I now invite you to begin the formal admission of our new fellows for 2021 by explaining a little about each of the routes to fellowship. The first of which this evening is for meritorious contributions to the profession. Thank you. Applicants for this route may be drawn from any part of the profession. They are expected to have made an outstanding contribution and positive impact on the advancement of the profession, with their demonstrable leadership making a significant difference in their chosen area of expertise. Examples include campaigning on or raising knowledge about mental health within the professions, involvement in veterinary politics via a number of different organisations, and public outreach about veterinary issues and the professions. Previous successful candidates for this route have included general practitioners, those working in the veterinary industry, veterinary associations, bodies and charities, and the armed forces. Here is a little more about the work of these new RCVS fellows and their important contributions to the veterinary profession. Professor Madeline RLH Campbell. Professor Madeline Campbell has an interest in ethics, particularly in her clinical field of equine reproduction and the use of animals in competitive sport. Madeline teaches at the RVC, is Professor of Veterinary Ethics at Nottingham and chairs the BVA's Ethics and Welfare Advisory Panel. Dr. Daniela Dos Santos. Dr. Daniela Dos Santos graduated in 2012 from the RVC and has been in general practice since. She has gained recognition for her leadership of the profession throughout the pandemic, her tireless work to improve animal welfare and championing of diversity and inclusion within the profession. Dr. Christiane E. Glossop. Dr. Christiane Glossop's early career focused on cattle and pig reproduction. In 2001, she joined the State Veterinary Service to help fight FMD and stayed in government veterinary work to become CVO Wales in 2005. She ensures the veterinary voice is heard, respected and valued. Dr Emma E. Goodman Milne Dr Emma Milne graduated in 1996. She is a patron of RWAF and the Dogs Trust, a trustee of DBRG and has worked with many other animal welfare charities. In 2017, she founded the initiative Vets Against Brachycephalism, which now represents vets from 67 countries worldwide. Dr. Richard G. Harvey. Dr. Richard Harvey graduated from Bristol University, initially in mixed practice, and then moved to small animal work, concentrating on dermatology. Richard has gained a PhD, RCVS and European diplomas published reviewed papers and contributed to a number of books in the field of dermatology. Dr. Fiona M. Lovett. Dr. Fiona Lovett is a sheep veterinary consultant and founded the Flock Health Club concept. She's been instrumental in establishing the farm vet champions with RCVS knowledge. She is also a chair of the Sheep Antibiotic Guardian Group and a clinical associate professor at the University of Nottingham. Mrs. Pamela A. Mosdale. Pamela Mosdale qualified from RVC and worked in first opinion practice. She was a lead assessor for RCVS Practice Standards Scheme and is currently a quality improvement clinical lead and chair of the QI Advisory Board for RCVS Knowledge. Mr. Peter G. Orpin. Pete Orpin graduated from Bristol in 1983 and worked in mixed practice until 2019. He was a BCVA president, co-founder of My Healthy Herd and director of a large vet practice in Leicestershire. Pete is currently an active member of Action Group Johns and a board member of SPVS. Professor Jonathan M. E. Statham. 
Professor Jonathan Statham is a cattle vet, partner and chair of Bishopton Veterinary Group, chief executive of Raft Solutions and a non-executive director of the Animal Health and Welfare Board. He is past president of the British Cattle Veterinary Association and holds an RCVS diploma in cattle health and production. Professor Sheena M. Warman. Professor Sheena Warman is an experienced veterinary clinician with a wide range of interests in veterinary education. She is a senior clinical fellow in small animal medicine at Bristol Veterinary School and is committed to improving educational outcomes for veterinary graduates. Many congratulations to all 10 of you and thank you for your many significant contributions to the veterinary profession. In our next cohort this evening, our new fellows have been recognised for their meritorious contributions to knowledge. Applicants under this route are expected to have made an outstanding contribution to the advancement of knowledge in their field, including, for example, scientific or educational scholarship and leadership. They are expected to provide evidence of a considerable body of work and experience in a subject area since veterinary qualification, typically over a period of at least 15 years. This might be via publications, doctorates, evidence of excellence and mentoring, scientific prizes and successful grant funding. Here are just a few words about each of our new fellows under the knowledge route. Professor Simon R. Bailey. After Professor Simon Bailey worked in mixed veterinary practice and completed his PhD, he held research and lecturing roles in the UK and US before moving to the University of Melbourne. He is currently Professor of Veterinary Preclinical Sciences, researching inflammatory diseases, pharmacology and endocrinology. Professor David C. Broadbelt. Professor Dave Broadbelt is Professor of Evidence-Based Veterinary Medicine at the RVC and is involved in teaching epidemiology, statistics and EBVM. He is co-project leader of VetCompass, the chairman of the Venom Coding Group and is the honorary treasurer of the SVEPM. Dr. Victoria J. Brooks Dr. Victoria Brooks is a lecturer in evidence-based practice at the University of Sydney. She is an RCVS specialist in veterinary epidemiology and her research focuses on emerging and neglected infectious diseases. Dr. Karmalan Jeevaratnam. Dr. Karmalan Jeevaratnam is reader in clinical physiology at the School of Veterinary Medicine, University of Surrey, with a special interest in clinical cardiology. His research uses integrative physiology and computational techniques to explain mechanisms of cardiac diseases in animals and humans. Dr. John F. Mee Dr. John Mee has worked as a veterinary research scientist and lecturer for over 35 years in Ireland and abroad, specialising in ruminant health and welfare. He has contributed to the field of bovine perinatology. John is a registered specialist in bovine health and production. Professor Richard J. Piercy. Professor Richard Piercy qualified from Cambridge in 1994 and then conducted training at Ohio State University and Imperial College, the latter as a Wellcome Trust Research Training Fellow. His clinical and research interests include neuromuscular disorders and gene and molecular therapies for animals and humans. Dr. Joan A. Smith. Dr. Joan Smith, a UCD graduate, has been a veterinary pathologist for most of her career in Northern Ireland and at the University of Connecticut, where she was also director of the State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. She has published extensively and mentored many undergraduates and anatomic pathology resident students. Professor Michael V. Thrusfield. Professor Michael Thrusfield is Professor of Veterinary Epidemiology in the University of Edinburgh and author of Veterinary Epidemiology. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, the first RCVS recognised specialist in epidemiology, foundation diplomate of the ECVPH and recipient of Dorimple Champney's Cup and Medal. Huge congratulations to all eight of you who have been admitted through this route 
and a warm welcome to the Fellowship. At this point, I'd like to briefly mention the Fellowship Ad Scientific Advisory Panel. The aim of the panel is to provide scientific underpinning for RCVS functions, including advising on scientific issues at the request of council, committees or subcommittees, and to ensure that debate on such issues is based on good evidence and sound advice. Dr Mary Fraser was appointed as the chair of the panel last year and has already done some wonderful work with the group during her first year. The panel is currently looking for new members to join them and would love to hear from prospective applicants. If you're interested in finding out more, you can get in touch by emailing fellowship at rcvs.org.uk. Many thanks. We now turn to our final cohort of new fellows this evening. They've been recognised for their meritorious contributions to clinical practice. Applicants under this route are expected to provide evidence of outstanding professional achievements, including clinical or educational scholarship or leadership, and to demonstrate their creation and interpretation of new knowledge through original research that has extended the boundaries of their discipline. They will be able to make informed judgments on complex issues in specialist fields, communicate their thinking clearly and effectively to specialist and non-specialist audiences, and through advanced applied research, contribute substantially to the development of new techniques, ideas or approaches. Please join me now in hearing a little more about each of our new fellows' contributions to clinical practice. Dr. Davina M. Anderson. Dr. Anderson has been a small animal soft tissue surgeon for over 20 years in both private and academic referral hospitals. She has a special interest in reconstructive and oncologic surgery and is also interested in complications and clinical auditing. Ms. Amanda K. Bogue. Amanda Bogue supported the development of emergency and critical care as a distinct specialist area in the UK and Europe and has published and taught extensively in this area. She also has a strong interest in veterinary leadership. Miss Martha J. Cannon. Martha Cannon is an RCVS specialist in feline medicine and co-director of a cat-only veterinary practice in Oxford. She is passionate about encouraging veterinary practices to become more cat-friendly. Mr. Timothy M. Charlesworth. Tim Charlesworth qualified from Cambridge in 2001 and gained the RCVS CERT SAS in 2006 and the RCVS DSAS Soft Tissue in 2012. Tim is currently Head of Surgery at Eastcott Referrals Swindon, is Chairman of the Academic Board for ISVPS and also examines for the RCVS CERT AVP. Dr. Junio B. Cherubini. Dr. Junio Carabini completed the ECVN residency at the RVC and became their lecturer in neurology. Junio became diplomate and European veterinary specialist in neurology, RCVS recognized specialist in veterinary neurology, and in 2007 he founded the neurology service at Dick White Referrals. Dr. Federico Corletto. Dr. Federico Corletto graduated with honours from Padova University in 1997. He obtained his CERT VA in 2002, his ECVAA diploma in 2003, and was awarded a PhD by Cambridge University in 2011. He currently works at Dick White Referrals and holds a part-time professorship at the University of Nottingham. Dr. Alexandra H.A. Dugdale. Dr. Alexandra Dugdale's career has included mixed practice residency and vet schoolwork and private referrals. Alexandra has been able to apply her fascination with physiology, pathophysiology and pharmacology to the clinical practice, teaching and advancement of veterinary anesthesia, analgesia and the wider discipline of perioperative care. Miss Sarah M. Gold Sarah Gould spent three years in general practice before undertaking a medicine residency at Cambridge. She was then the Bunning Fellow in Oncology for three years and spent over 10 years in private referral practice before joining the University of Bristol to establish the Oncology Department. Dr. Zoe J. Harfakri. Dr. Zoe Harfakri has worked in clinical, academic and private practice for 20 years. 
She has specialized in soft tissue surgery and has supported the development of veterinary students, interns, and residents. She is passionate about environmental sustainability in the veterinary profession. Dr. Catherine Hughes. Dr. Kate Hughes is a veterinary anatomic pathologist working in academia. She combines diagnostic veterinary pathology with research which focuses on the mammary microenvironment in a range of different species. Mrs. Nicola J. Calendra. Mrs. Nicola Calendra has worked both in academia and private clinical practice and is passionate about teaching and sustainable veterinary care. She enjoys skin and reconstructive techniques, head and neck surgery, and has a research interest in urogenital surgery. Dr. Emma J. Love. Dr. Emma Love is an Associate Professor of Veterinary Sciences at the University of Bristol. She has been involved in teaching, researching, and has worked as a clinician in the field of veterinary anesthesia. Mrs. Yolanda Martinez Pereira. Mrs. Yolanda Martinez Pereira gained her RCVS Cert VC in 2004, became a cardiology diplomate and RCVS specialist in veterinary cardiology. She has worked in academia and private referral and is a senior lecturer at RDSVS Edinburgh. Mr. Timothy J. Phillips. Tim has practiced as a specialist in equine surgery from the Liphook Equine Hospital, Hampshire, since 1995. He served as president of the ECVS and he was called to the Bar of England and Wales in 1999 and is also the current head of claims at the VDS. Dr. Heidi Radke. Dr. Heidi Radke is an RCVS specialist and active member of the European College of Veterinary Surgeons. In the last 15 years, as an academic at the University of Cambridge, she has made significant contributions to her field of small animal orthopaedic surgery. Dr. Zilke Salavati. Dr. Zilke Salavati is a small animal internal medicine specialist working at a university teaching hospital involved in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. She is passionate about advancing small animal gastroenterology, particularly novel diagnostics and treatments of chronic inflammatory enteropathies. Dr. Ian A. Self. Dr. Ian Self is a European and RCVS specialist in veterinary anesthesia and analgesia. He is currently the principal clinical anaesthetist at Cambridge Vet School and has a keen interest in anaesthesia of unstable patients and pain management. Dr. Christopher J. Shales. Dr. Chris Shales worked in mixed practice prior to specialising and worked at Cambridge and Bristol University before moving into private practice where he is now head of soft tissue surgery. Chris is active in clinical research, provision of CPD, and serves on committees for professional associations. Professor Robert F. Smith. Professor Rob Smith is a clinician, researcher, and head of the Department of Livestock and One Health at the University of Liverpool. He is involved in undergraduate and postgraduate teaching, out of hours clinical practice, and is a consultant to dairy industry stakeholders. Dr. Enzo Vettorato. Dr. Enzo Vettorato is an EVVS and RCVS specialist in veterinary anaesthesia and analgesia. He currently works as a consultant anaesthetist at Dick White Referrals and Newmarket Equine Hospital. He is author of several international publications, especially regarding small animal pain management and loco regional anaesthesia. Once again, my sincere congratulations to all 20 of you for your contributions to the profession and a very warm welcome to the Fellowship. Thank you, Kate, and I would also like to add my congratulations to all of our new Fellows this evening. That completes our formal admissions to the Fellowship for this year. I do hope that many, if not all, of our 2021 Fellows will be able to join us in person at next year's Fellowship celebrations, and I very much look forward to being able to meet you then. I know you would now like to say a few words, Kate, so the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. I would like to start by again congratulating all of our new fellows being formally admitted to the fellowship this evening, across all the different routes to entry. As the 10th female president of the RCVS and the first to lead an all-female presidential team, I am particularly glad 
to see that for the first time this year, more than half of our new fellows are women. My predecessor, Mandisa Green, spoke during her address last year about her passion for diversity and inclusion, including in the fellowship. And while this year's intake doesn't mean the job is done, it does demonstrate both progress and our commitment to widening access to the fellowship. Becoming a fellow is a superb achievement and it really demonstrates how each of you have contributed in a fantastic way to your respective areas of interest and endeavour. As fellows, you have demonstrated how veterinary professionals add value to both the profession and to wider society. So, for example, participating in this evening, we have renowned clinicians, researchers, academics and people involved in veterinary organisations and groups of various kinds. In my opening speech as RCVS President, I spoke about how I wanted to dedicate my year to building and strengthening connections that count. That is connections with ourselves, within the veterinary and vet nurse professions, and with allied professionals and wider society. Now, as members of the fellowship, you are in a great position to help extend our reach beyond the traditional boundaries of the veterinary profession and help amplify the veterinary voice, building these synergistic connections and collaborations with each other, with other health professions and with the public, all for the benefit of society. So I ask that all of you think about what difference you can make with your new status, how you can help build those connections to aid you in reaching new audiences to talk about the breadth of what we as vets do for animal health and welfare, for public health and for wider society. The extent of knowledge contained within the Fellowship, something which is increasing every year, can be clearly seen if you take a glance at our online directory of Fellows. It was also on display this week with our fantastic Fellows in Focus presentations and I'd like to thank our three fascinating contributors for those talks. Our Fellows of the Future competition has also demonstrated that we have a pipeline of engaged and passionate future young vets who are determined to use their voices to talk about the subjects they care about and build connections between the different generations of vets. I felt both very inspired and reassured about the future of our profession when I watched them. Hopefully, in 10, 15 or 20 years time, they too will be receiving their congratulations on joining the Fellowship. Looking at the immediate future, I'm pleased to announce this evening that applications for the 2022 Fellowship round are now open. So, if anyone in the audience this evening is interested in joining the Fellowship or knows someone who might be, please do visit our website for full details of how to apply. As we heard from John, we have made a few further modifications to the application process this year to ensure that the application and judging system is more comprehensive, fair and inclusive for all and we look forward to hearing from all of you who might be interested in applying. For now though, once again, I want to congratulate our fantastic new cohort of fellows and look forward to seeing the fellowship continue to deliver and grow as a learned society and trusted source of veterinary knowledge and expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Before we announce the winner of our Fellows of the Future competition, I wanted to briefly mention again our three Fellows in Focus presentations this year. What makes this year's talks particularly special is that two of the presenters, Joan Smith and Christopher Shales, were only welcome to the Fellowship this year. I'd like to give you a brief overview of all three talks and encourage you to watch them on the RCVS website at your leisure. Professor Mandy Peffers joined the Fellowship in 2016 by Diploma of Fellowship by Thesis. Her talk is called 
from Bovine Embryo Transfer Vet to Wellcome Trust Clinical Intermediate Fellow and explores her unusual career path into academia and highlights some important factors to consider when pursuing a veterinary research career, career in academia. I should also add that Mandy was also presented with the RCVS Inspiration Award recently in recognition of her work to encourage veterinary undergraduates and postgraduates to pursue careers in research. Congratulations Mandy. Dr Joan Smith joined the fellowship this year. Her talk is entitled Some Discoveries of Novel Diseases and Concepts Through Diagnostic Veterinary Pathology and explores how novel diseases can sometimes be discovered during the course of anatomic pathology or examinations of animals for routine purposes. Dr Christopher Shales is another newly appointed fellow for this year and delivers a talk entitled The Integration of Webinars Within Our Practice. This explores how he and the team at Willows along with many other practices of course, have taken advantage of society's growing familiarity with video conferencing technology to maintain their contact with their colleagues, other practices and pet owners, and how this has evolved into something very positive over the past 18 months. In his talk, Chris considers the pros and cons of online webinars in a veterinary context and whether they will re remain relevant as we begin to emerge from COVID-19 restrictions. Thank you again to all our fellows in focus speakers for their fascinating contributions. These recordings are available to watch on our website along with those from our speakers in previous years. Now we move on to the announcement of our winner of the Fellows of the Future competition. Earlier in the year we invited veterinary students and recent graduates to submit an original research proposal for consideration for the competition. We had 23 applicants which were all of an exceptionally high standard. We set up a panel which had the unenviable job of choosing the finalists, with six making it through to the next stage. We asked the six finalists to give a five minute presentation on their research to the Fellows of the Future panel, which we then published online at the beginning of Fellowship Week last Thursday. The judges found it an incredibly hard decision to choose a, a winner this year, and we want to thank everyone who has taken part. However, we do have a winner and a highly commended entry to announce both of whom will receive book tokens as their prize. I'd like to hand back to the RCVS president to make the all important announcements. Thanks, John. I'm really pleased to announce that this year's highly commended Fellows of the Future presentation is a cross-sectional study on enteric disease agents in UK deer by Samuel Pierce from Bristol Vet School. Congratulations, Samuel. And now, I'm delighted to announce that the winner of the 2021 Fellows of the Future competition is Amy Richardson from the Royal Veterinary College for her talk entitled Implications of Mycobacterial Disease Surveillance on the Health and Welfare of Freshwater Aquarium Fish at ZSL London Zoo. Many congratulations to you too, Amy. Both of your presentations really impressed the judging panel and I look forward to seeing your names on the fellowship directory in the future. Thanks Kate and congratulations to Amy and Samuel. We'd also like to give special thanks to the other four finalists, James Cockroft from Nottingham Vet School, Georgina Hopkins from the Royal Veterinary College, Stephen John from Surrey Vet School and Sophie Revzenzvig from Liverpool Vet School. The presentations were all of a really high standard and we thank you for presenting your research. To everyone here this evening, if you haven't already, I would wholeheartedly recommend watching all of the talks and showing your support for the next generation of RCVS Fellows. As a special treat, we'll now play the winning presentation in full as part of this evening's proceedings. Over to you, Amy. I'm Amy Richardson and uh, this is a study I conducted on the implications of mycobacterial disease surveillance on the health and welfare of freshwater aquarium fish. So mycobacteria are non-motile gram-positive bacilli that result in a highly infectious, chronic, progressive granulomatous disease. It is the most common global disease threat to freshwater aquarium fish and results in a high morbidity and mortality for these animals. 
due to its long incubation period, which can range from five to 270 days, meaning that it can remain undetected for extended periods. And due to the fact that it presents with vague clinical signs, it is often only diagnosed when animals are dead or showing obvious skin lesions. Experimentally, we carried out a full body histopathology on representative samples from the management calls of the four species studied, which included Gerardovnictis viviparus, Iliodon whitey, Amica splendens, and Northobranchius St. Housie. Um, these samples were used to, to um, estimate the true prevalence as well as the impact of mycobacteriosis. Um, and management calls. Um, were used um, as these animals had no visible signs uh, prior to euthanasia. Zeal Nielsen staining was used to uh, detect acid fast bacilli, which were morphologically diagnosed as mycobacteria, and uh, disease severity was graded uh, on a scale from minimal to marked. Uh, the image on this slide uh, shows the kidneys of four Northobranchia St. Housie. Um, a is minimal, B is mild, C is moderate, and D is marked. And you can see on the marked disease, um, the granulomatous lesions have almost entirely obliterated the uh, parenchyma of the kidney. Um, however, it's important to note that once again, this animal was swimming around with no signs um, of external disease. So this is a slide of one of the fish that I studied. And as you can see in the salomic cavity, there's quite a high proportion of fat. Um, there's food in the intestines. Um, and you can also see that there's a, a fetus in the overgut. Um, so the fish is pregnant. And yet when you look at the kidney, for example, there are these uh, large granulomatous lesions running throughout the parenchyma and almost obliterating um, the parenchyma. And there's the same lesions uh, in the liver. So despite the fact that there is this good body condition score, this uh, relatively good proportion of fat, the fact that they are um, eating um, and reproducing normally, uh, there is still this quite marked disease present internally. This graph shows the percentage of individuals per species with an overall severity of minimal to marked with the overall severity determined by the highest severity organ per individual. In all four species, over 80% of individuals had some form of granulomatous disease with all Northobranchia St. Housie affected. Iliodin Whitey had the highest percentage of individuals um, with a disease severity of moderate or higher. This graph showed the percentage instance of mycobacteriosis per species. Mycobacteriosis was found to be prevalent in all species that were studied, despite the lack of clinical signs. And Iliodin Whitey, once again, had the highest disease prevalence with an instance of 67%. In conclusion, mycobacteria is a very common, highly infectious disease. It's difficult to diagnose due to the minimal clinical signs. And moreover, it's difficult to treat and manage within an aquarium setting. It causes significant lesions that likely lead to pain. And this raises welfare concerns for what are often um, endangered populations. So what's the answer? Well, more proactive surveillance practices need to be implemented. And this may require a, a small proportion of individuals to be culled um, in order to give a more accurate over, overview of the population as a whole, rather than relying on those individuals that already have visible clinical signs or are already dead. This will then allow um, appropriate preventative techniques and treatments to be implemented, and this will improve the health and welfare of these fish. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I would also like to thank the various people who enabled this to happen at the Francis Crick Institute and the Zoological Society London, including my supervisor, Dr. Simon Spiro. And I would also like to thank the Royal Veterinary College for funding this project. I hope you all found that as impressive as we did on the judging panel. I would like to thank again all of our finalists and everyone who took part in the competition. The
future of our profession is indeed in very safe hands. At this point, I would just like to say a few words about the impact of the past 18 months. They've been an incredibly challenging time for our veterinary and veterinary nursing students, and I take my hat off to all of them for studying and training under such tough and unusual circumstances. The fact that we had so many great entries to our Fellows of the Future competition demonstrates just how resilient and dedicated our students are, and on behalf of the Fellowship Board, I would like to extend my best wishes to all the vet schools and VN colleges and to all the vet and vet nursing students. I would also like to pay tribute to the Herculean efforts of our veterinary and veterinary nursing colleagues across all areas of veterinary work throughout the pandemic and acknowledge the huge challenges they have faced and the adaptations they have made over the past 18 months. Although we have all come so far since the early days of the pandemic, I know how tough it still is for many of our vet and VN colleagues, even as things have started to return to some semblance of normality. To use a well-worn phrase, we should continue to be looking out for all of our colleagues across the veterinary professions. In a moment, I will ask Kate to introduce Professor Tim Spector as our keynote speaker this evening. As Tim's presentation has been pre-recorded, I'm afraid there won't be an opportunity to ask questions this evening. But if you want to find out more about his work, you can follow him on Twitter, at Tim Spector. Kate, over to you. Thank you, John. Tim Spector is Professor of Genetic Epidemiology at King's College London, scientific co-founder of Zoe Limited, and for the last 25 years has been studying a cohort of 12,000 twins in the world's largest study of adult twins. One of the areas the Twins UK project has studied is nutrition, and it has demonstrated that all of us, including genetically identical twins, react differently to the same foods. The Twins UK cohort is now the most intensively studied group of humans on the planet. Tim's study of twins has demonstrated strong genetic influence on disease, but only a modest genetic influence on microbial composition metabolic function and response to food. His PREDICT study of thousands of people is the largest nutrition intervention of its kind. He has helped identify the role of sleep, exercise, meal timing and sugar dips as additional personalised factors surrounding nutrition. Understanding these aspects and how our unique microbiome profiles are influenced by specific foods in our diet is paving the way for the new era of personalised nutrition, a concept that recommends food that best suits our own unique needs and circumstances, and which is breaking the dogma of a one-size-fits-all approach to nutrition. Tim, thank you very much for talking to us this evening. We are very much looking forward to hearing you speak. Hello everyone, my name is Tim Spector. I'm a Professor of Genetic Epidemiology at King's College London and also scientific co-founder of the nutrition science company Zoe and lead investigator of the Zoe COVID app. And I'm going to give in, be giving you a, a lightning tour through what's been happening in the last few years uh, in the world of the microbiome and personalised nutrition and really trying to answer the question of what is the future of personalized nutrition. Now, some of you know that for nearly 30 years I've been working with twins. Um, we have 14,000 sets of twins that we've been studying at St. Thomas's, half identical, half non-identical, looking for the first 10 years of how, how genetic many conditions were that people thought were age-related, for example things like back pain, arthritis, uh, macular degeneration, even things like hemorrhoids. And these turn out to be actually more genetic than many of the cancers that um, have attracted much more research. But the last 10 years really I've been focusing uh, on why identical twins are different. Twins where one might be um, overweight, the other one skinny, one uh, depressed, one happy, uh, one crippled with arthritis, the other one not. And obviously with identical twins, they have identical genes in every cell in their body. So 
and they lived for the first 18 years of their life together. So something else must be going on. And what I think interested me was that the microbiome was the most uh, logical explanation for these differences. And that's really where I got into this um, about 10 years ago, which coincided really with the an accident I had while ski touring in the Italian Alps that ended up me going, having many MRI scans and finding out that I had a, a form of vascular occlusion uh, that led to me getting double vision and uh, sudden hypertension. So I went from being what I thought was a very healthy middle-aged guy to someone who's popping lots of tablets. And that made me go to the internet and really started this whole idea about writing books on nutrition uh, from, from scratch, because what I found on the internet was really um, that I couldn't believe anything there. People were still talking about the calorie as if this was the holy grail, that calorie counting actually worked, that we should be avoiding high fat foods, eating starchy foods, etc., and that still this concept that uh, exercise is the good way to lose weight. And everyone was saying that there's, you should believe the government, believe the NHS, there's one diet that really is healthy for everybody. And we know that's complete nonsense. So this work really um, led me to go on and uh, discuss thinking about food in different ways, thinking about nutrition in different ways and realizing that it's not about calories or macronutrients, it's about all the hundreds and thousands of chemicals that are in both in foods and in our bodies that are important. And it also made me question um, why we've done so badly in understanding uh, human nutrition, why we've got so many things wrong. And I think it's the failure to address this uh, this complexity and this is well illustrated with a study by a colleague of mine, uh, Christopher Gardner, who looked at low fat diets against uh, low carb diets in 600 overweight Californians and supplemented them both groups with healthy greens and fiber and um, really found no difference at all between those groups. So that both groups after a year lost five kilograms, but when you look in detail at the, at the uh, data, you can see some people in each group uh, could actually lose or gain um, up to 20 kilos. So we may need to try and work out whether you should be in what type of person you are, what's your metabolism. And I think when we ask experts, as uh, the company Zoe did recently ask 13 professors of nutrition in the US and the UK and asked them to rank 105 foods. There was very little consensus in many of those foods in the middle. Lots of consensus on things like rice and biscuits and KFC. And on the other hand, good consensus that olive oil and berries and black coffee are good for you, but no consensus about dried raisins, dairy products, low-fat dairy, uh, cheese, orange juices and fruit juices or diet drinks. So the sort of all that stuff in the middle, no consensus at all. So this is all because of this complexity that we've um, now understand between all the metab met metabolic pathways in our body, the perhaps 30,000 metabolites that are there, also linked to the 30,000 chemicals we think are actually in food, that in turn link to the third post of this equation, which is the uh, microbiome, which has uh, maybe up to 100 trillion bacteria, archaea, it's got 500 trillion viruses, we've got fungi, got parasites, and this microbiome is best thought of now as a unique 
organ, a virtual organ in our bodies. If you put all the microbes together, they weigh about the same as a human brain. And I think we should start thinking about them as, a, as an extra uh, liver uh, in the way we, we think of things. And they really are key for many of our body's main functions. So not only the immune system where it interacts with all the immune cells that are mainly in our gut, but uh, in the way we metabolize food, the speed at which we break it down in our, in our guts. And it's linked to producing uh, all these chemicals. So microbes are, are chemical factories. And that's what we need to start thinking of as because they will then interact with virtually all the medications we take. And that's why as humans, some people respond well to paracetamol and others don't. Why some people respond to antidepressants and others don't. It's all down to our unique set of gut microbes. And we know that the neurochemicals are also important for uh, anxiety, depression, uh, and increasing evidence of uh, in schizophrenia and other personality disorders. So microbiome is crucial. It's a very new specialty and it's still evolving fast all the time as our techniques for measuring it are getting better. But the way to think of it is trying to summarize all the last 10 years data that most chronic diseases that you can measure have an association with the gut microbiome. Now, some of this is causal, some of this is consequential. But the everything from obesity, heart disease, diabetes, um, fatty liver, food allergies, any inflammatory condition, um, frailty itself, Parkinson's, depression, anxiety, autism, all come under this, this similar banner, uh, and as well as think more minor problems such as IBS. And people in that group, they have different microbes coming and going, but the main summary is that they have less diversity of microbes. So their guts have less species, which means they're producing less uh, helpful chemicals. And I think that's really uh, key. Whereas if you're healthy, you don't have these conditions, uh, you're relatively slim, you've got a, a good diet, your gut microbes are gonna be like a uh, healthy English garden. I think that's the way to think of it. You have plenty of flowers, lots of chemicals. The soil is also full of microbes. It's, a, it's an environment that is um, not wasteful at all. Every little chemical is being used or reused and recycled. And we did some study with the uh, combining uh, the British Gut Project with the American Gut Project a few years ago. And the sweet spot for getting the ultimate diversity of your microbes seems to be around 30 um, different plant species uh, a week. And that sounds a bit daunting to many of you, but remember that a plant uh, is also a nut, a seed and a herb. So it's not as hard as it seems. Now. Um, people ask me how easy it is to change your microbes. We obviously, we start life with zero microbes uh, for the birth, and they're all over the place for the first three years, then they start to stabilize. But um, I visited with, when I was uh, working with the BBC a few years ago on a, a documentary, went to stay with the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, and it like they did for uh, over three days. They have four times the amount of uh, fiber we do, and they have hundreds of different species of animal and plant that they uh, will eat every day. They don't have fridges, so they just go out and uh, really do hunt and gather. And they live in a place that where actually food is pretty abundant. And within, uh, three days, I did manage to improve my gut diversity by um, 20 or 30 percent. But it did go back to uh, baseline as soon as I got back on the KLM flight and had some airline food on the way back to London. Now, the data that really got us started was when we started looking at the microbiome in twins. 
and we got the idea about 10 years ago and it took us a while working with colleagues in, at Cornell to put this together and we eventually published the findings in Cell and it showed that there was a link between uh, obesity and uh, gut microbes and looking at twin pairs where one was overweight and the other one skinny the overweight one always had a less diverse microbiome and the skinny one always had a couple of had more beneficial microbes and, and two in particular popped out this uh, Christensenella and Akkermansia and when we took them and we put them back into sterile mice we can actually uh, fatten them up uh, if we gave them uh, no bacteria but we gave them fatty foods and we could stop them getting fatter if we uh, gave them uh, implanted these uh, microbes into their guts showing that it wasn't just a correlation but they had a functional effect in this animal model and that's the lovely thing about the microbiome is you can switch between humans and uh, test whether that has any functional importance in this amazing uh, germ-free model uh, that uh, Jeff Gordon in the US has been pioneering. Now, um, the next um, thing I need to tell you about is what makes your microbes worse. So how do you get into this bad state? You know, and for my, uh, my second book, The Diet Myth, I, I did a lot of self-experimentation. I just finished doing the French cheese diet, which consists for three days of only eating unpasteurized raw milk cheese, which um, assisted, was assisted only with a glass of red wine and the occasional cracker and apple. And I can tell you, it's a fantastic diet for the first day, but by day two and three, you're really not looking forward to a smellier poiss or a rock for breakfast. But uh, the next challenge I was gonna do was the 10 days McDonald's diet, but um, I found a better volunteer. This happened to be uh, a student who was keen on McDonald's and lucky for me, was also my son. So Tom got enrolled in this and he was very keen and he uh, essentially um, did very well for the first few days, but came back um, to me on day four and said, uh, Dad, I'm not feeling so well. Do you think we could um, stop the experiment now? And, uh, and I, I, of course, as a concerned father said, no way, we're going to finish this and write it up in the Sunday Times. And of course, that's what we did. And at the end of the experiment, he had lost 40% of his gut microbes, which he still reminds me of. And it's been very difficult to get his uh, microbial level back to uh, anything healthy, despite lots of food parcels and uh, guilt trips. Um, let's talk a bit about the other foods that can help you. So as well as this concept of the 30 plants a day, I think we need to be talking about prebiotics and um, also uh, polyphenols. Lots of greens are important and it's the variety of the greens and the fiber that is definitely important, but we've always been neglecting this variety. And the variety also is the variety of polyphenol chemicals. These are the antioxidant type chemicals that we used to talk about before we knew what they did, that every plant has that gives it that often bitterness, the astringency on the tongue and the defense against the sun or uh, against insects. And it turns out these plants are the healthiest for us to eat. And as well as um, many high polyphenol uh, greens, uh, lettuces, cabbages, etc., um, uh, onions, whatever. Um, unusual ones, Miro thought of, is that nuts and seeds have very high levels of polyphenols, and that's why uh, they used to be thought of as unhealthy, but now we know they're healthy. Another one is coffee, really high uh, polyphenol levels. I'll explain why coffee, despite the caffeine, is uh, really good for your heart. 
Um, red wine's another one, uh, has probably has the highest concentrations apart from coffee uh, of polyphenols and uh, dark chocolate above 70% as well as uh, extra virgin olive oil. So think polyphenols in your food choices, very important. And of course, you probably already know about probiotics in food. Uh, I'm sure most of you eat some yogurt, unless you're vegan and uh, you can get synthetic soy ones, but the, the principle is the same. It's generally better to have uh, live microbes in food form than it is in tablet form. Cheese is another one, and even the processed cheeses do have live microbes in them. But obviously it's better to have the artisan versions, get many more, and the blue cheeses are the best. Then of course you've got even higher concentrations in kefir, uh, kimchi, kombucha, uh, and sauerkraut, etc. Um, there was a study last uh, month, I think it was, that came out showing that if you just add a single serving of mixed spices to uh, people's meals, or if, certainly if you're in Singapore, you can actually increase the uh, gut microbiome. Very small study, but I think it, it lends an idea that you don't need masses of uh, these plants to have this kind of effect. So let's talk a bit about uh, personalizing nutrition now. And I think what's interesting is where we are at the state of technology. And I was giving a talk five years ago in London, I think it was the National Geographic Society about my book, The Diet Myth, when uh, two internet entrepreneurs came to see me just afterwards and they said, we'd love to talk to you, Tim, about uh, forming a company related to nutrition and microbiome and working out how to personalize it. And so I said to them, that's fine, but you guys are gonna to have to find millions of pounds for me to do the research first, because I'm not interested in a company that's just based on hot air and marketing. And I didn't think I'd see them again, but they turned up in my office a month later saying, we've got the money. And that's where the company Zoe was born. That's where the PREDICT studies were born. And in record time, we had uh, done all this. And this is all possible because of five things that came together. Firstly, there was big data and the ability to use artificial intelligence on massive data sets with good computing time to get prediction algorithms. We had the technology of the continuous glucose monitor, which couldn't have been imagined 10 years ago, that you can get a readout on your phone for two weeks of your constant blood uh, glucose levels. You can get finger prick testing that looks for multiple metabolomics that you can do at home. And you've got an app that you can uh, record your uh, food frequency questionnaire. You can scan products. You can uh, give yourself scores. You can photograph your foods with, and you can actually have a, a nutrition coach with. And finally, the technology to fully measure your gut microbiome uh, through uh, metagenome sequencing has come down in 10 years from a price of around 7,000 pounds a sample to less than 100 pounds a sample. So all this came together at per just the perfect time, just as uh, these two internet entrepreneurs who've been uh, doing algorithms for adverts wanted to uh, make more of their lives and, and met up with myself. So then we started to work on the PREDICT study, which was published um, in Nature Medicine, one of the top journals in the world, a uh, year, uh, year and a half ago now. And this was quite a unique study. We had 1,100 people, both in London and Boston. Most of them were twins and we gave we threw everything at these, at these people, uh, gave them identical meals. We took bloods 10 times a day for the first day. We measured them with DEXA machines. We uh, collected metabolites. We collected uh, heart data, everything. And then for two weeks, they um, monitored everything they were eating and their blood sugar and their blood fat responses. Now, 
The first thing that I saw when we, we, we got to the results was the amazing difference between people. The amazing variation in these healthy people in their blood glucose and insulin levels and their blood fat levels six hours after a meal. These varied eightfold between people. And that really was amazing because fasting bloods don't differ that much. So we, the fact that we had this amazing dynamic response to the identical meals that were different between all of us suddenly lays the whole foundation for predicting it uh, and personalized nutrition. And so we uh, took this data and then made it into a, a home commercial product. Now, the other big insight we got was that identical twins were only slightly more similar in terms of their microbiome than uh, the unrelated public, but they also had different responses to food. It was only very lightly genetic, which is not what uh, you would have expected and not what all those commercial companies selling kits tell you. So many twins were good. One would be uh, predominantly a fat metabolizer, the other a, a sugar metabolizer. And this was really important for me, um, changed my vision of what I wanted to do for the rest of my career um, and moved away from genes and moved into the microbes. So genes have a very minor role in how we respond to foods. The other, the other experiment I, I took part in with uh, four other people from Zoe was to eat these muffins all day, uh, every four hours. And I must say it was probably the worst 24 hours of my life, having these giant glucose spikes and these uh, dips afterwards. Really had an effect on my brain, gave me brain fog, felt tired all the time. Things I didn't think were would have been possible until I did the, the experiment. I also found things about myself I didn't know that I was actually metabolizing food better at the end of the day than the beginning, which is not the um, common uh, belief. Um, and this led us to also look at some of the patterns that we were getting from the million or so, the two million uh, read sugar blood glucose readings we had. So uh, we just published this uh, about three months ago in, in Nature Metabolism, where we looked three hours after a meal and what, the sh what was happening in the blood sugar. And we found about one in four people were having a sugar dip. And those people uh, ended up reporting greater tiredness levels and uh, greater appetite and were using, eating a, a two or 300 calories more each day than people who didn't dip. And I think that, that was fascinating because suddenly not only are we showing the power of the sugar response to elicit other physiological phenomena that aren't just related to insulin. But we also show that giving a dipper or a non-dipper an identical muffin, you get a very different response and a very different calorie intake. So the idea that calories are always equal to calories in whatever the context, again, is just blown out of the water by this simple experiment. Um, we then went on to look at microbes and in much more detail and again published in Nature Medicine this, this paper um, just uh, six months ago and it, it was the first paper to link eating certain foods with certain microbes with certain health outcomes and so that's really what we did in this uh, study using the latest metagenome sequencing that is now the the gold standard for this field uh, allows a level of detail that we just didn't have before. And this allowed us to um, find uh, initially 15 good microbes and 15 bad microbes that were associated with uh, certain foods and it's turned out to be healthy and unhealthy foods. So this allowed us to suddenly give some personalized advice about uh, which foods work well and which uh, how you can boost someone's good microbes and suppress their bad microbes or their uh, inflammatory ones. And so collecting all this information has allowed us to have a very holistic approach to um, 
in order to get people to make meaningful change over years that's sustainable. And this is all helped by these machine learning algorithms that combine data on weight, um, sex, exercise, their blood biochemistry, sleep levels, amount of inflammation after meals, uh, the timing of your meal and what you had the day before, your gut microbiome, uh, and many other factors that we continue to add to improve our prediction model, which is currently doing pretty well overall, about 80% uh, prediction uh, from the standard meals to real life scenarios. Now, uh, just tell you about the Zoe program, uh, because this is currently available in the US and will be coming to the UK in the new year. And uh, it's a great way to learn about yourself, but also gives an insight into these amazing technologies. And um, you can, the, the website joinzoe.com has all the details. Now I got my results, which I'm going to share with you. Uh, for basically, it comes as three sort of groups. First is the blood sugar control, and I scored uh, 11 out of 100, which is pretty dreadful. Um, my grandmother was diabetic, and when I, I put the CGM on, I found I really had pre-diabetes, so uh, that wasn't good. I had my blood fat, I thought, oh, hopefully I can have as much fat as I like. That gave me 10 out of 100, so I was pretty dreadful there as well. Um, and uh, the one saving grace is my microbiome uh, was up in the top fifth uh, centile. So uh, I'm being held together probably by my gut microbes. Uh, Zoe then gave me a list of the foods I uh, in ranked in order of healthiness. None are excluded. We don't talk about calories at all. But in this, for example, I was able to see that I should be eating less bananas and more pears because the scores were much better for uh, pears and apples than bananas. I should be having um, uh, pasta rather than rice or even brown rice. Um, I should be avoiding virtually all breads except uh, sourdough rye. Uh, and I should be having yogurt for breakfast and not uh, uh, healthy muesli. Uh, and so the final result I got actually is the other thing that might be helping me is I've got a parasite. And normally it's not a good thing to have a parasite. And uh, I know many, uh, many animals as well as humans have them. Uh, this is blastocystis, which 31% of Britons have and about 10% of Americans and it turns out that this actually reduces in, in the population uh, reduces levels of fat levels of visceral fat and your blood fats and inflammation so it's it's a good one to have so if anyone wants uh, to have, get a sample of mine uh, they can contact me later so I was given these gut boosters which is just a list of uh, foods or plants that are I should be having more of to increase my good microbes and reduce my bad ones. So these range from apples, broccoli, lentils, uh, courgettes, um, carrots and spinach, and uh, there's a much bigger list. And that, that advice is continuing to grow as we get more people uh, doing the Zoe test. Um, we also, as part of the, uh, the initial Zoe study, uh, did measure transit time and we used not the Bristol stool chart which is the, the current human method of doing it but we used uh, a new method using a blue dye and a muffin and basically you just time how long it takes this dye to go from your mouth to the toilet and we uh, ran a social media campaign called the blue poop challenge and we've got um, hundreds of thousands of people around the world doing it which is great fun and uh, advise you to do it as well because there is a serious side. We published this in the journal Gut. It's a very good indicator of your gut health. And um, this might also be applicable to animals. The longer the transit time, the worse the uh, gut microbes were. And so it is a, a cheap, easy way to get a, a handle on your 
uh, microbiome and is much better than any other clinical test there. Now, um, finally, in the last few minutes, just to uh, tell you that the Zoe team uh, and combined with the, my team at King's College London, when we were being closed down last March and all our twin studies and uh, nutrition studies were put on hold, we wanted to help the COVID effort. So uh, I convinced the Zoe company to all for five days to work on a, an app that would uh, get symptoms uh, in large numbers of people so we could start predicting uh, who was getting COVID around the, the country. And amazingly, it worked and uh, four and a half million people ended up downloading the app, uh, mostly in the UK, but also in the US and Sweden and given us about two, about two to 300 million uh, health reports and huge scale. And it also allowed us to do uh, real-time reporting and uh, allowed us to do medical research in a way we hadn't thought possible. We got a million people to do a diet survey uh, just in a week and gave them feedback on it. And um, we also showed as we've been talking about nutrition, that diet quality is an important risk factor for uh, severe COVID and ending up in hospital. And if you combine that with deprivation, you've got a, a deadly uh, combination. Um, we had lots of impacts of the app, um, which I won't go into, but a lot of them were about symptoms, finding loss of smell, uh, COVID rashes on the hands and toes, uh, tongue, um, and uh, symptoms in children being different. And as we've been uh, trying to, to push the government into changing their symptom list of COVID, which is currently uh, nothing to do with the three classic symptoms that they are talking about now. 50% of people present with cold-like symptoms, uh, flu-like symptoms, with sore throat um, and headaches and uh, uh, runny nose being predominant. So COVID-19 and nutrition actually have quite a lot in common. Um, not only do it involves lots of choices every day about whether you shake someone's hand, put a mask on, wash your hands or not, uh, as well as like we make choices about what food to eat, but everyone responds differently. And I think we've all seen that in the COVID pandemic, just as we have in nutrition. One size fit, fits all advice just doesn't work from the government. Uh, genes play a relatively small role in the variability of our response to COVID and our response to food. Gut microbes do play an important role, and I think that's why um, the major risk factors, obesity, diabetes, poor quality diet, sleep, etc., are all linked. Um, food quality is an important factor on both, and both have been helped by AI methods uh, and personalized prediction is now possible in both. And we're using the uh, COVID app now to try and work out individual predictions for uh, vaccine failure when people need boosters. So it's a lot to cover, but I um, uh, hope you've got those take home points. Firstly, I think the fact is we're all unique and uh, we should be proud of that uniqueness. Microbes are key to our, uh, our this uniqueness and our response to food and our response to COVID. And the key for us all to be healthy is to improve our gut diversity and the four points to remember our eat your 30 plants a week, eat high polyphenol foods, eat fermented foods daily, and finally avoid ultra processed foods and snacking. And don't believe much of what you were taught uh, when you learned nutrition. It's most of it is unfortunately rubbish. Personalized nutrition is the way forward. And I think the apps are also the, the way forward to do uh, medical research. If you want to learn more, um, read uh, one of my, either the two books, Spoon Fed or Diet Myth, and um, have a look at the Zoe website on joinzoe.com uh, for everything uh, nutrition related. And uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this. Tim, thank you very much indeed for a truly fascinating and thought provoking talk. I think we can all reflect on the fact that while standardised approaches to certain issues or problems that confront us are useful templates, 
we also have to try and consider the particular circumstances of what's in front of us, whether that's a particular clinical case or a piece of research we're conducting, and adapt accordingly. So thank you again, Tim, for speaking to us this evening. We really appreciate it. I'll now hand back to John to round off our evening. Thank you, Kate. And thanks once again to Tim for taking the time to give us such an engaging and interesting talk. We really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us. I've been following Tim's work since I was a PhD student in the 1990s when I listened to his research presentations on genetic and environmental factors contributing to osteoarthritis in human beings. In addition, the Zoe app that Tim and his team have led during the pandemic has been very useful to me personally, um, helping to inform decisions for our veterinary workplaces. So it's been a real privilege to have Tim as our keynote speaker this evening. Thank you. And with that, it now falls to me to draw our proceedings to a close this evening. On behalf of the RCVS and the Fellowship Board, I just wanted to thank all the people who've helped put together this year's virtual fellowship evening. To our Senior Leadership Initiatives Officer, Kerry Chick, for devising our virtual programme and inviting our speakers. To the team at Think BDA and Imagine Presentations for producing and hosting the online content for us. To Ian Holloway in the RCVS Communications team, and to our fantastic events team, in particular our Senior Events Officer, Chloe Baxter, for expertly organising the whole event and bringing it all together so seamlessly. Thank you all very much indeed. My warmest congratulations once again to all our new fellows who I look forward to working ever closer with over the weeks, months and years ahead. And of course a big thank you to all of you who've joined us online this evening to hear our live broadcast not from the Royal Institution, but from my small little study on the Wirral. Good night and thank you. <laughs>